Hello and welcome to Ayer Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zubko. Today we're going to speak about India-China relations, which I think it's a slightly underrated and under-researched topic in international relations. Usually we speak about the US and China, about Russia-China and European Union, but India and China, it's just fascinating topic to speak about. My expert and guest today is Yaganathan Panda. Hello. Hello, Martin. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. Dr. Yaganathan Panda is a senior fellow at the Haag Center for Strategic Studies. Currently, he is based in Stockholm, where he is the head of Stockholm Center for South Asian and Indo-Pacific Affairs. Also, he is a professor at the University of Warsaw. In addition, Dr. Panda is also the director for Europe-Asia Research Cooperation at the Yokosuka Council on Asia-Pacific Studies. Also, he is International Research Fellow at the Canon Institute for Global Studies in Japan, and also Senior Fellow at the East Asian Security Center at the Bonn University of Australia. He has also many other functions in, in editorials and journals and, and various institutions, but that would be for another 20 minutes because Dr. Panda is very active in international relations. And let's start with the first question, which is very crucial questions for understanding uh, China and India. And that's Galvan Valley. We know that it's a historical border dispute. We know about clashes, about people who died over there as well. So what is the meaning of that Galvan Valley? and all those clashes around for the relation between China and India? Well, I think uh, if we try to evaluate the entire uh, boundary dispute between China and India, the Galwan Valley incident or the Galwan Valley tension, which is still going on, which is still ongoing, um, is one of those darkest episodes in china India boundary dispute. As we know that uh, the Golwan Valley incident actually started during the pandemic and it was really unexpected from India's point of view. The way the Chinese military and the chi China actually orchestrated the, 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 in, the, the kind of military transgression or the incursion in the um, western sector of China and India boundary and also coming to the Golwan Valley and trying to capture India's, uh, uh, India's territory and trying to uh, change the status quo. That is one of those problematic aspects from India's point of view at present, because what we are continuously watching um, uh, in China's uh, uh, military and diplomatic uh, posturing is a continuous uh, um, aggressive behavior, a behavior which is not only militaristic in nature, uh, which is very aggressive, but also um, it is very, very problematic in terms of changing the status quo on the ground as well as in the relationship. So from that point of view, the Golwan Valley incident is a problematic aspect in India-China relations. And also from India's point of view, I think um, the kind of casualties happened during the um, Golwan Valley incident during the pandemic, that explains that China can never be trusted. Uh, you know, uh, from the Indian side, there were um, 20 casualties. And from the Chinese side, we don't know how many casualties, even though there has been few um, you know, reports we suggest it could be uh, 40 or 40 plus uh, reportage of the death from, from the Chinese side, but we don't know the actual number of casualties, casualties. So that's China for all of us. It's a very clandestine country. It's a very um, country which uh, wants to keep the opposition on a suspense and wants to really create damage to the overall, uh, you know, kind of a um, changing the status quo. And I think that is one aspect uh, we should be noting about China. Um, so three points I would like to make at the end of, the, uh, of this of this uh, questions that you asked. The Golwan Valley incident uh, explains to a fact that China and the boundary dispute is an ongoing one, and it is unlikely to uh, end at any point of um, any any point uh, in near future. Second, uh, we can take a, um, um, uh, note that. Uh, there is absolute seriousness from India's side. Um, and uh, the situation on the ground between China and India are so fragile 
that anything can happen anytime. That means we could expect a militaristic conflict between China and India, even though not a big scale. At least on a small scale, we can uh, say we can we can see that these problems might take a turn. Third, I think uh, what the Golan Valley incident explained that gradually the Chinese claim on India's territory are expanding from time to time. Um, and we we could say that this expansion of the on the Chinese claim is only expanding from time to time under Xi Jinping's leadership. So since Xi Jinping has come to power, we have seen that the Chinese changing the ground um, and, and trying to have new claims, which are very problematic from, from India's point of view. And Dr. Panda, are there any negotiations ongoing about this topic or it's all frozen at the moment? Of course, there are negotiations going on. I mean, uh, originally, if we see, uh, there has been uh, two, three mechanisms um, which has been at play in terms of uh, about the boundary negotiation. Um, there was um, first, uh, you know, defense dialogues. Then there was, uh, you know, um, uh, a special representative level dialogues, which is at the level of uh, national security advisor from India side and from the Chinese side, from the state councilor level. So that has been going on for last two decades or so. And then there was a WMCC uh, working uh, mechanism on consultation and uh, coordinations. But what we have seen over during the pandemic and also uh, from the from the Duklam and Golan Valley incident, uh, from the Duklam Valley incident which happened in 2017 and the Golan Valley incident which happened in 2020, uh, 19 and 20, uh, you know, uh, from that incident onwards, we are seeing that now there is a commanded level dialogue on the ground, which is trying to address the situation. But I think the problematic aspect about this negotiation process is that every time that the Chinese are trying to have a new claim and they want to derail the negotiation process. So there is no continuity about the negotiation process. We don't know which negotiation process is really critical from China and the boundary dispute and its negotiation point of view. Uh, the way the Chinese are actually trying to capture the territories, the way the Chinese are trying to change the ground realities, it is actually very problematic and it actually derails the negotiation process. So, you know, to answer your questions, yes, there are negotiation process going on. Uh, albeit right now, it is going on very slowly. But at the same time, uh, this negotiation process are not really anything um, concrete in nature. It are unable to sol- give a, a ready-made or a on-ground solution, um, practicalities is missing. These uh, negotiation processes are just uh, a process to continue about the negotiation process rather than trying to create any kind of solution to the to, to the boundary dispute. So therefore, um, negotiation processes are there, but it is not really effective. Right. And Dr. Panda, the last question is about the, the Galvan Valley. From the Western point of view, for instance, my students, when we spoke about this topic, they said China is big, India is big. How is it possible that such a big countries can negotiate one territory, which from the Western point of perspective is small? So how would you answer these questions to the students that asked it? Every point of territory matters. Every inch of territory matters. And therefore, uh, in every country would value every inch of their territory uh, because the government of the day, they're responsible to the people. So democratic countries, uh, you know, functions on the base of accountability. Unlike the communist and the authoritarian countries, they could negotiate as per their demand and about their, uh, as per their uh, government choice. Uh, that is not really possible in a democratic country because people's board the government to protect their national territory and national land boundaries. So for, from India's point of view, every inch of territory matters, and particularly it matters when China has captured a chunk of land, including Oxai Chin, in the 1962 war. So in 1962, China attacked India and defeated India and captured some of the territories. So we have been, you know, um, uh, we have been demanding for the return of those territories. So China cannot have more territories from India. So therefore, um, uh, from an international relations perspective, it is uh, really 
uh, a serious matter and um, we need to value every inch of territories if we really need to talk about a kind of peace and stability on the boundary uh, in, in the bordering regions. From West point of view, from the point of view of the Western countries, I think um, the Western countries are also facing the same kind of um, revisionism from the Chinese, how the Chinese are trying to change the status quo on, on the relationship, on, on providing support to Russia's aggression uh, in the uh, towards the European countries, particularly to the Ukraine. So I think uh, waste, particularly the European communities, are going to face same kind of Chinese authoritarian practices, how China is trying to change the game, to change the status quo, and we should be really mindful. So therefore, there needs to be a greater strategic compatibility between India and Europe and India and West on, 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 on the China issue. Right. We also know that India is part of the Quad Alliance, where we have United States, we have Australia and Japan. So, but China didn't like it when India joined Quad because of the, you know, tensions in Indo-Pacific. So what is the impact of membership, of Indian membership in the Quad Alliance from the Indian point of view when India wants to challenge, or China wants to challenge, the territory of Indo-Pacific? Well, uh, first of all, uh, there is nothing called membership in the Quad format. Quad is a official mechanism. Um, it, is, it is more of a informal groupings. Now, continuously and gradually, it is becoming a formal groupings. But it is not an organization per se. So there is no membership per se. So I don't think India has a membership or any of the countries are members. But what Quad has, it has a constituted groupings of four countries, uh, US, Japan, Australia, and India. And India is an integral part of Quad. Uh, but to the Chinese, uh, they do see the Quad process more as a kind of a, kind of a initiatives um, by the Western countries, particularly by the US, um, trying to deter the China's rise in the regions and China's, uh, you know, uh, foreign policy dealings in the region. So therefore, the Chinese have um, seen the de development of the Quad uh, more in antagonistic note. And they have said, in fact, um, from time to time, they have called, you know, you know Quad as a kind of a um, extension of a military adventure by the US in the Indo-Pacific regions and also a kind of an a kind of a form of an Asian NATO, um, which is not uh, correct because uh, Quad is a, just an informal groupings, which is tr ha trying to have its act together, and therefore Quad cannot have a formal groupings. They, it 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 is not a militaristic unit. But to China's concern, I think uh, what China is taking a note about Quad process is that all the four Quad countries are actually democratic countries, and they are strong militaries and strong economies uh, in the world politics. And therefore, uh, the Chinese are believing that um, if all of these four countries come together, then there is a credible alliance which could be built in terms of posing a strategic challenge to India, uh, sorry, a, a strategic challenge to China in the Indian Ocean regions and in the Indo-Pacific regions. And therefore, they are concerned about the Quad. More importantly, I think what China anticipates is that all of these four countries are having strong navy, uh, naval presence in the in the Indian Ocean region. So therefore, the Chinese anticipate that the Quad countries will come together and try to deter China's maritime expansion in the Indian Ocean region. And therefore, they are concerned about the Quad. Otherwise, Quad is more an, a kind of a grouping which is looking for the welfare of the regions, trying to preserve the rules-based order trying to have a uh, protection to the sea line of communications, trying to have a more collaborations on maritime security, how to preserve the sea line of communication, how to preserve, you know, uh, marine ecology, how to go for um, marine, um, uh, you know, fisheries and uh, green economies uh, in the ocean. So it has a, a multiple agendas on sub-security issues, um, but for the Chinese, these are the security issues and that problems uh, that 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 uh, you know that comes as a huge problem for the china's foreign policy and maritime adventure in the indian ocean region 
You mentioned China's expansion, naval expansion. How is this impacting the Indian Ocean and India's sort of maritime security? Do you see any challenges over there? Oh, yes. Uh, I think the China's uh, maritime expansion in Indian Ocean is a, is a really problematic aspect. In fact, there are three aspects to China's maritime expansion. One, China is gradually becoming a developing a blue water navy capability. Um, it is going deep into the Indian Oceans, touching many islands, uh, not only in the immediate Bay of Bengal to Southeast Asia to, um, you know, uh, in the in the in the Gulf region, but also it is going deeper into the eastern coast of Africa. So therefore, the China's maritime capability is expanding from time to time, and it is emerging as a blue water navy capability, having submarine station, submarine open stationing in the Indian Ocean, and that's a more problematic aspect. Second, I think the Chinese are trying to have grey zone strategy um, with a militaristic and economic coercion strategy. And this grey zone strategy is very closely linked with China's uh, maritime security strategy, particularly um, what it is having under the Belt and Road initiatives. Um, as we know, China has um, you know maritime Silk Road. Um, so the maritime Silk Road projects of China is very closely linked with China's grey zone strategy. Uh, through that, China wants to have new ports, new stationing points, and uh, new dwelling points in the Indian Ocean, and these are the problematic aspect of China's maritime strategy. Third, I think the way the Chinese are providing um, economic assistance and militaristic assistance to some of the Indian Ocean region countries, particularly like Maldives, like Sri Lanka, so they are taking into confidence the smaller economies in the Indian Ocean regions and trying to develop their own capabilities there through investment and through uh, creating ports and listening points. So. These are the problematic aspects of China's maritime adventure in the Indian Ocean regions that countries like India and um, many other Quad countries are concerned about. So from India's point of view, India is a uh, you know country which is exposed to the three sides of the ocean, Indian Ocean. Um, on the one side, we have um, Gulf um, uh, to its west. In the eastern side, we have Bay of Bengal. And in the um, southern side, we have uh, Indian Ocean. So uh, India is exposed to the sea. From these three sides, India wants to protect its um, coastal regions. India wants to protect the sea line of communications. And most importantly, India wants to protect the uh, maritime trade capability for itself. So therefore, I think these are the important aspects. And I think the way the Chinese naval capabilities are expanding, it comes as a serious concern for India in times to come. Based on your research, does India have sufficient investment in naval expansion or modernization, we can say. I think there are three aspects to it. One is that what we are seeing currently is that India is reviving a lot of old projects in the maritime domain, uh, trying to revamp its maritime strategy and uh, naval capability. Uh, for example, we have Project Mosam, um, which is a, uh, you know, a kind of project which talks about the weather conditions um, from one direction to the other direction. So when the wind goes to the one direction, all the Indian ships and navies goes to that direction. And when the wind changes, they come back. So it's a maritime trade business that India wants to revitalize in the Indian Ocean. Then we have spice routes programs, um, spice routes projects, which India wants to revamp through its, um, um, you know, Indian Ocean Rim uh, Association countries and also the countries which are in the deeper zones of Indian Ocean, uh, extending to the African, Eastern African um, you know, um, coastal areas. So therefore, um, these are the projects India is trying to revive, uh, which is going to um, improve India's naval capability. Second, India is trying to also develop its own maritime capability in terms of having um, submarine capabilities, in terms of having more maritime exercises with like-minded countries in the Indian Ocean regions or Indo-Pacific regions, particularly with, um, with the cooperation of the U.S., uh, France, um, and also with Australia and Japan. Right. And these are the countries with whom India is having much more serious, uh, you know, practical maritime um, cooperations, which is going to improve India's naval capability. Third is, I think what we are seeing is also a kind of a undersea cable networks that India is uh, building. 
uh, India is planning with uh, with countries like Japan and also talking to Australia about this. And uh, this way, India is well aware that it's not only the maritime shipping, but also undersea um, capabilities should be enhanced. And therefore, we are focusing a lot on the undersea capable, uh, cable networks. The fourth is we are also developing our coastal um, developmental plans. We are inviting investment from South, to South Korea in order to um, have more indigenous um, you know, uh, kind of a um, uh, knowledge-based uh, uh, empowered coastal belt. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, India's uh, geography is exposed to the three sides. So the, we want to build our uh, coastal belt strongly so that we could drill with any eventuality. But the other point is, I think um, we have a Make in India um, a flagship program. Under the Make in India program, we want to invite a foreign counterparts or a foreign company to invest in India and be a partner in the co-production capabilities. And there, South Korea is emerging as a critical naval power. Uh, Israel, um, Japan, uh, US, uh, including Australia, they are uh, becoming critical uh, naval partner for India. And therefore, overall, we are seeing a lot of uh, revision in India's maritime strategy as well as uh, uh, you know, novel uh, strategy to improve the capability in times to come. Great. Dr. Panna, there is a question from students. Does India have own belt and road style project like China? Unfortunately not. Um, India's economic uh, capability is not that par with China. As we know, if we try to compare the Chinese economy and in Indian economy, Chinese economy is actually uh, four four times higher or five times higher than the Indian economy. So what today the world is seeing in terms of One Belt, One Road, Ithai Yilu or a Belt and Road initiatives is that uh, the Chinese economic competency gives a boost to its Belt and Road initiatives. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of India, uh, it is not really viable because India cannot afford to have such kind of Belt and Road initiatives which covers almost half of the world uh, in terms of connectivity planning, in terms of export and import planning. But what India is trying to do is trying to associate with critical countries in the regions, in different continents, to have more bilateral and mineral mode of connections. So that is something what India is really serious about. So therefore, unfortunately, India does not have a mega projects or initiatives like the Belt and Road initiatives, but India has many small um, connectivity projects which are making India as the fulcrum of the Indo-Pacific regions, and therefore we are emerging as a critical country in the Indian Ocean region. We have to mention that India has a strategic position globally, because there are so many, you know, strategic things going around: cables, uh, maritime security, and everything. But one of the issues I would like to mention is energy security, because India has several choke points around. And these choke points are used by China, by Japan, by other countries to get some energy supplies. So do you see any potential challenges when it comes to energy security between India and China? Well, I think um, energy security is becoming a prime domain of um, um, rivalry among many countries. And therefore, it is bound to have a kind of uh, rival note between China and India because we know that both the countries are the largest populous country in the world. India is the number number one populous country today. China is the number two. And at the end of the day, the people of China and India, they need a good uh, sup, you know, supply chain of networks, uh, which will um, allow them to gain energy, um, be it oil, gas, or electricity, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, kind of it. Um, energy coming to the country. So therefore, the government of the day are very particular about securing the energy security, energy uh, capability, uh, um, and they want to improve the uh, energy capacity reserves in their country, um, which is also making them a, a kind of a competing country. We know that, you know, resource politics is the main hub of politics today in, in, in today's world, be it um, energy politics in the maritime domain, or in the land uh, corridor domain. Uh, I think uh, both China and India are going to compete for 
getting energy not only from the Middle East, uh, from the Western Asia, but also from the Central Asia and from the maritime zone. So there is uh, competition rivalry bound to grow between India and China. When we speak about India and China, we usually focus on two countries, but there are also two big diasporas living abroad. And this is a question about the soft power and diaspora politics in shaping bilateral relations between China and India. So what are your thoughts about the power of Indian diaspora and also how how people react when they meet together, when they live together abroad? Is it different than in India or is it similar? Of course, the diaspora community plays a stronger role um, in, 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 in the case of India and also in the case of China. But in the China's case, what we have seen is that uh, they try to use it more as an um, economic investment kind of a channel of communications between China and the Chinese diaspora community. Uh, but and, and they also try to work for China as a kind of a network agency. Uh, in India's case, that has not really been fruitful uh, a couple of decades back. But with the current government in Delhi, the last one, one decade or so, we are seeing that India is trying to expand the networks with the overseas community Indians, uh, the diaspora, Indian diaspora, those are based abroad, based out of India. And uh, India wants to use them more as a networking uh, channel of communication between India and the world. So therefore, there is not only economic channel of communications, uh, inviting all of these uh, richer Indian communities who are staying abroad to invest within India, but also trying to have a much more um, uh, strategic linkages in terms of trying to, you know, uh, push forward India's soft power image. And to that extent, I, I think uh, this is a very useful practice that the current government in Delhi uh, is is implementing, particularly under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So there is a, the Indian diaspora communities at the strength of Indian economy at present. They are emerging as a strength and uh, there will be more continuity will be coming um, in, in times to come. There is one quite sensitive question, but but I have to ask, and that's about Pakistan. We know that China is pushing relations with Pakistan, and there are certain projects. What's the role of this collaboration between Pakistan and, in, and China for India, for in relations with China as well? Do you see the role of Pakistan as significant or it's overstated? No, I think uh, uh, the China-Pakistan relations is a problematic um, uh, pro problematic development for India. But uh, this uh, relationship is not there as a problem uh, only in recent past. I think uh, the relationship between China and Pakistan has been building for some time, for last two decades or three decades. And I think India is mindful about that. And I think under the Xi Jinping's foreign policy, which is called as New Era Foreign Policy, uh, Pakistan constitutes as a strong partner from the South Asian region, from the Himalayan Belt region. And therefore, uh, it, it does concern India. And particularly it concerns India because when you take into account the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which goes through the disputed region of, uh, you know, uh, of, of uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir that India calls it, um, who, uh, then it becomes a problematic aspect because both China and Pakistan will have a long say on, on these aspects. So these are the problematic aspects from India's point of view. More than that, I think um, uh, what we are seeing is that how China and Pakistan are coming together in terms of on the Kashmir, not only on the Kashmir issue, but also in terms of trying to change the status quo on the Western sector of the India-China and India-Pakistan borders. And therefore, uh, these are the, the China Pakistan chemistry, the bilateral chemistry comes as a dual posed, uh, uh, you know, dual uh, pronged uh, threat phenomena to India's national security. Um, and more importantly, I think uh, the hybrid threat uh, that both China and Pakistan are promoting is a concern and is a serious concern for the regions that India is worried about. I know that your time is limited, but let's go for the last questions for today's interview. And I would like to use your experience, which, you know, that's that's years of experience, to underline for the Western scholars, maybe junior scholars and students, what is important to understand about India and China 
as two states competing, being rivals, sometimes adversaries, in the contemporary world, where do you see some limitations that Western scholars or students have when researching this topic? And you can basically elaborate on this a little bit and tell us some guidance, maybe some piece of advice from your experience, based on your experience, so we can better understand both countries when researching them. Well, I think there are uh, three aspects where China and India are competing and are going to compete with each other. And this was about my last book that I published uh, in 2016 uh, on the rootless. The title of the book is India-China Relations, Politics of Resources, Identity and Authority uh, in a Multipolar World Order. So basically what we are going to see is that China and India are going to contest with each other on three specific issues. One is on the resources, energy resources, or on the land and the maritime resources. And I think that is going to emerge as a, a more problematic aspect in China and India relation. Second aspect, which are going to be more contesting between China and India are the identity politics. The identity politics are uh, is uh, about who is going to save the Asian order, who is going to save the global south order, who is going to save the um, you know, the, the 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 regional order in times to come. So in order to have that superiority on each other, in order to have that leader of the global south, I think uh, they will fight and they will, um, you know, uh, behave each other and treat each other as rival. So there will be this identity politics of um, having a supremacy complexity uh, towards each other will be a problematic aspect between them. The third aspect is the authority politics. The authority politics, who is going to dominate whom in different multilateral forums and regional forums in different regional and global settings. And therefore, we will see that China and India are trying to, um, uh, you know, uh, balance it, each other and trying to dominate each other in various multilateral forums. We know for a fact that China is a permanent pipe country and China is going to, um, you know, dominate. Um, in most of the UN forums as a P5 country, uh, that kind of luxury does not um, have with India. But uh, we are also witnessing that India is expanding its multilateral ventures and multilateral networks and participation in various global forums. So multilateral forums and uh, various global forums are becoming a competing zones for China and India. So I would say that in three in these three particular sectors both China and India are going to compete with each other and treat each other as rival. Those are the, the resources, the resource politics, the identity politics, and the politics are trying to you know, maintain the authority in multilateral uh, forums and multilateral organizations. So therefore, we cannot expect that China and India relation will be peaceful and uh, stable in times to come. In fact, there will be much more unstability arising in China and India relations, and that will make the region volatile. Dr. Panda, thank you very much for your time, insightful thoughts, and that you share your experience and research with us, because as I said, this is this is very interesting topic for research for, for all the aspects from energy to security, cyber security, identity politics, as you mentioned. So, that's great that you were able to share it with us. Uh, I wish you good luck and lots of energy for your research. I know that you are doing a lot. You are producing many papers, ma many books. So thanks a lot for being on IR Thinker. Thank you, Martin. Pleasure talking to you. Please stay in touch. Thank you and see you next time. See you.